Afghanistan. And that number is likely to grow. And this is a huge shift away from doing foreign policy and military and security work through government employees to doing it through private contractors. They're doing everything from delivering meals to troops to guarding diplomats, convoys, and bases. And all of this is presenting an enormous risk to what I would call core public values. The values of human dignity, the value embedded in the law of armed conflict, that the use of force is limited in armed conflict, and values like transparency, public participation, and uh, oversight. Now, we've seen numerous high-profile incidents that illustrate uh, the risk to these values. There have also been many uh, lower-profile incidents involving the use of force. The Commission for Wartime Contracting also tells us that we could have saved billions of dollars if we had better oversight of contractors. Um, the main point that I make in my book is that our legal and regulatory architecture which was designed in an era of government workers overseas, cannot cope with this enormous shift. And I look at the impact on these values and at several mechanisms that I think have been affected, but which can also be used to better protect these values in an era of privatization. And I should say that the starting point of my book is somewhat controversial because I think that these contractors are here to stay. I think in some cases they are performing beneficial functions. We need them. We rely on them. We're dependent on them. And so while some people argue we should eliminate contractors, I think that that's not possible, it's not feasible, and probably not desirable. But instead, we should think about uh, improving, well, we have to think about improving our regulatory architecture. And I'd like to focus on uh, four mechanisms of accountability and oversight. Legislation and litigation, which is commonly talked about to begin with. Then contract management and oversight. Public participation and transparency mechanisms. And finally, organizational culture, which I think is very little discussed, but which is very important. Turning first to legislation and litigation, I think the dominant narrative is that we don't have enough laws on the books to cope with contractors and our shift to using contractors. And while I think there are gaps in the laws, I think the dominant problem is not that. The dominant problem is our enforcement regime. So let me give you some examples looking at criminal law. Um, if contractors commit criminal acts, and I don't mean to suggest that they all do, but when they do, and many have, um, what law do we have to deal with that? Um, international criminal law arguably would apply in certain contexts, uh, but we don't have a good enforcement mechanism for that. Host nation law might apply, but in a lot of settings, particularly in contingency operations, host nation courts just aren't equipped to uh, deliver fair trials and fair justice. Um, we've expanded our military law to address cases involving certain categories of contractors. Um, arguably, there may be some constitutional problems with that. I'm happy to talk about why I think that may not be a huge problem in these cases, but um, we're not using that very often. So well, what about ordinary uh, criminal law? I would argue that our own courts are probably the best place to handle cases of severe contractor misconduct. We've got a whole range of statutes, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, the War Crimes Act, uh, 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 the um, uh, Special Maritime and Territorial, ter Territorial Jurisdiction. All of these confer some basis of jurisdiction on our courts to handle cases that arise overseas. There are some gaps, and we can talk about those, but the bigger problem is our lack of enforcement. We've had few cases that have come to trial, despite many, many incidents. Why is that? Well, I would argue it's not the jurisdictional problem. The problem is we need to have a more enforcement authority centralized in the Department of Justice. Right now, the U.S. attorneys have the authority primarily to bring these cases. They don't have the incentives. They don't have the expertise. If we put more authority within the DOJ, we could build up a cadre of lawyers who have that experience and who have the incentives to bring these cases. We also need in-theater uh, uh, investigative teams. 
uh, in response to the 2007 Nisar Square shooting by Blackwater Guards uh, in, in Iraq. It took two weeks before uh, FBI investigators got there to, to, to gather evidence. And um, that case against the Blackwater Guards was unsuccessful, I would say, largely because of evidentiary problems that are due to these lack of investigative teams on the ground. So those are the things I would argue for. Turning to civil law, we actually have um, a number of cases percolating their way through the courts uh, that use tort remedies and to, as a measure of accountability for contractors. And while I think our military has very significant uh, justification to uh, shield military decision making from scrutiny in ordinary <coughs> tort suits, I think there are some cases where uh, tort liability probably should be used as a means of accountability. And um, there are three categories of cases, cases against, uh, cases brought by uh, uh, troops who've been injured by contractors, cases brought by contractors, contract employees themselves, and uh, finally, civilians who've been injured by contractors. Many of the cases are being thrown out on political question grounds and immunity grounds. Um, but there are some courts that have said these things are factual matters to decide. Uh, I think that the district court in the case against Khaki and Titan uh, for abuses at Abu Ghraib got it about right. And the federal district court for D.C. said, you know, in cases where there isn't governmental supervision of contractors, where uh, the... Uh, where there, where there isn't a clear line of authority and there isn't clear supervision, then perhaps some of these immunity doctrines shouldn't apply and it should be at least a factual inquiry. I want to shift gears now and just say a little bit about contract management and oversight. This is a huge issue. Um, and I think here we can draw some lessons from our domestic experience of privatization and outsourcing. We've outsourced a whole range of functions from healthcare to welfare to work programs to prison management. Some of it has worked terribly, some of, some of it has worked okay. Um, I compared and contrasted some of the publicly available contracts for foreign affairs outsourcing with some of these domestic contracts. And I think that they really, they fall far short and we can learn a lot from our domestic experience. Um, particularly in the initial stages of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts, the terms of the contracts were very vague, shockingly vague, uh, arguably. We've made a lot of improvements, um, but still we could do much better to specify the kind of training, for example, that uh, these contractors uh, receive. And in fact, um, after the New Source Square incident, the Kennedy Report noted that um, the Blackwater contractors had not received um, sufficient training in, in the use of deadly force. And the Commission on Wartime Contracting very recently noted that training remains an issue for some contractors, not all. I think we can address that, this in part through better contractual terms. Also through oversight and management of the contracts themselves. Um, we've increased the contracts, but we've reduced the number of management and oversight personnel charged with monitoring them. So between 2001 and 2008, we doubled, more than doubled, our DOD obligations on contracts from 92 billion to over 200 billion. Um, the people who are doing the oversight the contract management personnel, they don't have sufficient training. They don't want to go into conflict zones. Um, they also have uh, fragmented responsibilities. There are different rules for different agencies. Uh, there's poor coordination on the ground. Commanders often don't know when contractors are coming through their area. Now, we've made some improvements here, but I would argue not nearly enough. This is not a sexy issue. There's no political constituency for increasing the contract management workforce. Um, but we have to do it. We have to somehow make this into a political issue because otherwise our whole system isn't going to work. And then finally, with respect to contracts, I just want to say a little bit about accreditation. I think accreditation uh, is a tool we can use to increase uh, contract oversight and, and quality of services. We can look at the domestic setting. 
In some domestic contexts, we have independent entities rating and monitoring private firms along various benchmarks of quality. And then if those firms get a certain report card, that's when they get the contracts. 